Thank you. Thank you, Jane, and thank you all for uh, soldiering on uh, in this uh, interesting times that we're living in. Um, so I thought it would be kind of cool to talk before lunch about the things people don't like to talk about. Uh, and by the way, if you hear my throat is a little hoarse, uh, don't worry, it's not COVID-19. Um, I took the red eye in and then went to a noisy restaurant, and anyone who knows me knows how much I like to talk. And so I was trying to be heard by my friends across the table, and uh, that, that unfortunately is the result. Uh, so today, I will do my best to project, but, uh, but bear with. Um, so our talk will focus on dirty data, right? Blockchain is a database. It's got all sorts of interesting features. You all know about this. We've been talking about this uh, all day uh, and yesterday. But things that people don't tend to talk about so much are how do we make sure the data getting into our blockchain is the data we want? And so that's what I'll talk about today. We're living in a world of enormous amounts of data. Right? We are presently looking at 44 zettabytes of data that have been generated just in the last few years. And to give you an idea of how big 44 zettabytes of data is, if we printed out uh, um, that data into book form and we stacked the book, you know, one on top of the other, we would make 10 round, you know, we, we'd have 10 journeys to the sun, five round trips. That's how big 10 zettabytes, excuse me, 44 zettabytes of data is. A lot of the people who touch and manufacture and govern this data are the fangs and the bats. Right? These data oligopolies have arisen. So we know them as you know, Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, Google, and Baidu, Alibaba, Tencent. Some might throw you know, Apple and Microsoft into that mix, but the point is there's a very limited number of these organizations and they've got their hands on a lot of this data. However, there is some good news that within the past few years, government policymakers have stepped in and liberated your data from the fangs and the bats. Okay, great. Open banking, PSD2, GDPR. Uh, CCPA is the, the California Consumer Protection Act. So we've got now a body of emergent regulation that's propagating across the world that's liberating your data from the fangs and the bats. And, and some of this data is finding its way into distributed ledgers. Right? One of the exciting things is seeing how we can take that static data and make it more dynamic and interactive. We can begin to attribute value to various things that previously were, were sort of difficult to keep track of and remove all the middlemen, okay? Very exciting. But, to quote Apollo 13, Houston, we have a problem. These are the, the four horsemen of dirty data, all right? The first one is data decay. How many of you work with consumer data? Anyone? Anyone? Okay, we have a few. Um, if you take someone's name and address down, how many of you work with small business data? Okay, so let's call it half of you work with either consumer or small business data. Um, that data gets stale, it ages around things like name and address, 20 to 30% a year. Within a few years, your database is obsolete. You've got to refresh it. Now we put it on a blockchain, it's there forever. What do we do? Okay, that's data decay. Unfortunately, a lot of data that gets put into these databases is inaccurate. It's incorrect data, right? I signed up for a, a, what's called a Dunn's number, right? You go to Dunn and Bradstreet, which has a monopoly on small business credit information, and they issue you a unique number for your small business. So my consulting company, Visionary Future, fill it out. Well, when they keyed in the information to set me up with my Dunn's number, they put me in as visionary few true, which is sort of an interesting name for a company, but it's not the name of my company. Getting it fixed was awful. Now imagine we put that in an immutable ledger. Okay, so incorrect data. What's worse is if people make up things, fake news, 
false information. And they put it into a, a database, right? Malicious data, deliberately incorrect data. That also is contaminating our data stream. In fact, there are large-scale state-sponsored efforts to deliberately contaminate our data stream. Things like voter registries are getting messed with. And finally, synthetic identity theft, right? I'm gonna take your legitimate data and attach it to the wrong person. It's crap, and now thanks to distributed ledger, it's immutable crap, to quote uh, uh, a senior uh, financial services executive. Um, or if we wanna be a little more polite, it's rubbish. Okay, so now we've got this permanent rubbish, thanks to the, the four horsemen of dirty data. What do we do? We've got to be able to do something about this. Well, you know, not unlike what we're all being told now to do, you got to wash your hands. You got to clean your data. Engage in data hygiene. Data hygiene is not a new idea. All right? My first job out of college, well, my second job out of college. My first job out of college was uh, working off Broadway doing theater. But my second job out of college, was working in a big Wall Street investment bank in their data department uh, um, running database systems. And data hygiene was a core, core part of my job. It's not very exciting, but it's necessary to make everything else go. And so we need better data hygiene. What is better data hygiene? Well, you wanna audit your data and take a look at the four R's excuse me, the five R's, as part of putting together your good data hygiene strategy. The five R's are relevancy, recency, range, robustness, and reliability. You'll notice some of this applies to things like, is my data quality good in terms of, is it correct or not, and others relate to, is my data quality good in terms of whether or not it'll let me do what I'm trying to do? But taken together, this ensures you have good data quality. So, relevancy, is it the right data? Recency, how fresh is the data or has it decayed? Some data stays the same forever, other data changes very rapidly, a lot of it's in between. The range, right? What's the scope of the data? If you're doing a census or voter registry and you only capture half of the population, you've failed in terms of range for your data. The robustness, what is the signal to noise ratio? A lot of that 44 zettabytes of data that I was talking about earlier is noise. Can we extract the most important data and put that into, let's say, immutable records we don't need to keep track of all the noise other than to know that it exists and avoid it. And finally, how accurate is the data, right? Did we get either accidentally wrong data or deliberately wrong data entering our system? And a data audit, when you have someone come and look at your data to make sure that it's been set up correctly, will look at these five R's. Convergence is your friend, okay? We bring together not just DLT, but also AI and big data analytics. And these are tools which can help make your data quality better, have better data hygiene, clean data, not dirty data, right? Imagine you put an AI filter in front of your data before it makes it way, its way into the distributed ledger. And it is very good practice that every six to 12 months you do a data audit. You have a third party firm come in and check your data in terms of your data architecture, your data scheme, and maybe they'll sample some of the data to make sure that we've been able to keep good hygiene. It's just like going to the dentist every six to 12 months. You wanna have your data checked because bias, for example, can enter into financial databases very easily if you haven't audited your algorithms. 
And that's the other thing. Your audit is not only about the data, but about the things touching the data that put it into your immutable record. There's one very large financial institution that adopted an algorithmic lending program. And they were very excited because their loan losses went down. And you know, it was all very good until they did the tech audit of their algorithm. And they discovered that the AI had taught itself to discriminate against poor people. Good practice to audit what you're doing. Okay, so the prescription for better data, because we all want better data here, right? First of all, you know, the conversation we just had now is a level of data literacy that most of the people you work with don't have. So helping people get better educated about what issues can creep into data and how to make it better is a first step. Secondly, you want to make sure you have processes and technology in place for core data hygiene. Third, AI filters can help make this better. Fourth, you can run analytics on top of those filters both to make sure they're behaving and also to improve what you're doing with that data. And finally, check yourself before you wreck yourself. You want to make sure that on a regular periodic basis, every six to 12 months, you're running an audit on your data and your algorithms. And this kind of work is part of a project that I'm now spooling up through my academic relationships called the Institutional Digital Assets Project. Because the mainstream, digital, uh, mainstream asset management firms and financial houses are starting to treat digital assets as a serious asset class. But in order for them to really advance into that thesis, they need someone to help them understand how it plugs in with the conventional system. And so we're trying to help, uh, uh, help these organizations participate in uh, token-based assets, conduct research on some of the issues, and then what this talk ties into is disseminating best practices. So I'm David Schreier. I've put out a few books recently on some of my thoughts on blockchain and data and identity. Uh, so this is where to find them. And I'm happy to take questions now. Yes. Okay. Okay. So it's like, okay, why don't, we put, why don't we pull it together okay. and then put it on the blockchain? Okay. But then I think the question comes in is about transparency, right? All right. And is it actual the data? Because when we talk about, you know, oh, we put it on the blockchain, so, you know, it's the correct data. If we actually do something with the data before that, then that, that selling point kind of vanishes, right? So how would you, like what, what sort of- It, it depends what you- implement, you know? Yeah, so it depends yeah. what, you're, what you're doing with that. You're, everyone pre-processes data before they put it on the blockchain. It's just a question of how much. No one is taking a raw feed from my phone and directly putting all of the data from my phone onto a blockchain. There's all sorts of processing that's going on before it gets there. So first of all, you know, don't kid yourself into thinking that just because we say we put the data on a blockchain means we literally put all of the 44 zettabytes of raw data onto the blockchain. No one is doing that. Blockchain can't handle it, right? Imagine the latency. However, what you can do, and this is something we talk about in uh, Trusted Data, is something called open algorithms. So there's an open source code project right now, OPAL, open algorithms. So if you go to opalproject.org, you can read about it. And we're essentially saying those algorithms that are processing that data, let's have a group of independent experts verify that they're not doing something bad, that they're not misbehaving. And those certified and approved algorithms are the ones that you'll use to, to run on your, on your data. It's actually blockchain independent. It could be just for regular AI big data analytics, but it also can make blockchain better. David, um, I'm interested in the five R's 
And I'm wondering whether any of that is... I'm sorry, interested in... Say again? I'm interested in the five R's. The five R's, yes. And in terms of audit. Okay. Yeah. Um, auditing your data. And I'm wondering mm -hmm. whether that's any different today as opposed to historically. Wouldn't that be what you do anyway? Shouldn't they, but that be the foundation of your data strategy, independent of technology? Yes. So, and I, and I said this in, in my talk, um, this is not new. The idea of data hygiene is not new. What's notable is that we are dealing today with the same problems I was dealing with 25 years ago as a junior data program, database programmer. And so, yeah, I still have to talk about this stuff, unfortunately, because even today, we still don't have good data literacy and good data practice and good data hygiene. But the, the importance of it has become magnified because now we're taking that data and we're making it immutable. So now it's even harder to correct when we make a mistake. So let's, let's just save ourselves a lot of pain later and fix the mistakes up front. Yeah. Okay, other questions? Uh, I think we've got a couple here and then a couple more down front. Hello. You didn't tell anything about the data lineage. How do you think about the data lineage is important in when you manage data? The data, I'm sorry, I'm missing the... Uh, data lineage, so... Data lineage, okay. Horizontal lineage, vertical lineage, and so on. Yeah, um, well, I mean, so... So one argument will be... You're right, I did not get into that. It was a little beyond the scope of this discussion. The basic idea is, when I'm saying, oh, we have this data and we'll put this through, we sort of touch on it with the relevancy point. Is it actually coming from the right place? Um, and the range point, are we encompassing the right data? The data, data provenance would be another way to phrase data lineage, yes? Yeah, so like where is it coming from? Um, actually an interesting point is where, where blockchain becomes an adjunct or an adjuvant to something else. So in, in, in our recommendations about how GDPR and other similar sort of regulations can be actually implemented and made good for the consumer, um, we suggest DLT can be the lineage tracker. It's not the main core thing, but it's the audit trail that tells you what's being done over there with your data and what the data lineage is. Um, so it's a, it's, a, it's a related concept, but slightly different to what I was talking about. Yeah. I think there was one question there and then two down front. Short questions now, lightning round. Regar reg regarding existing data that is not on the not on the blockchain yet. Yeah. Would would AI would be useful in terms of cleaning up that existing data before putting onto the blockchain? Yes, as long as you know what the AI is doing. AI explainability. You got to know what how it's manipulating the data, and it can be helpful in figuring out of that existing data what do we want to put on the blockchain and how can we clean it up. For sure. Uh, so the question was, how hard is it to train an AI to do that? And the answer is, unfortunately, it depends. So happy to talk offline, but the short version is, AI is not a panacea either, and you have to use it intelligently. Um, so I think there are a couple of questions down front. I know you had a question, sir. Yeah, I mean, just on, I mean, you mentioned a lot of this stuff had been around since time immemorial. Yes. Quite often, but um, are you seeing a change now in leadership, actually focusing on data governance and the things you've talked about here across industry? Yes, yes. Industry is much more now focused on data governance because they have to be. A lot of people complain about regulation constraining innovation and make it more difficult, but frankly, it's because we now have data regulations that management has woken up and said, if I don't get this right, I could be fined 4% of my global revenue, so I better get it right. Yeah. So yes, much more talk in the C-suite around data quality, data governance, and distributed ledger as part of a solution set. There's uh, one right there, yeah. Thanks. Do, do you think the blockchain then will reinforce data integrity at the front end? So if I run my algorithms and find out that I only get a 50% subset of data that I then put on my blockchain, that shows I inherently have something wrong with my systems in the first place. 
Yeah, I mean, I think, I think blockchain actually has a number of interesting direct and indirect roles to play in ensuring the integrity of data. Um, and one of them is this whole observer effect. If we know who's looking at our data, then they will change their behavior in terms of how they deal with our data. And I think that's a good note to end on. Uh, I will hang out for a little bit uh, at the break, but thank you all for your time.